I believe Marcia has gotten maybe an eight or a 10 year sentence out of this. My wife and myself have got life sentences out of this. How she proceeded to move from being a legitimate stockbroker to a fraudulent Ponzi scam artist. She was very well thought of. She worked at a local bank here, was really my first uh, uh, acquaintance with her. Well, I've been a receiver in other cases, and I've represented individual receivers. I've never had a case like this. This is the lobby of the old First National Bank in downtown Oklahoma City. During the Depression, this was the largest bank between Dallas, Texas, and Kansas City, Missouri. This lobby is on the second floor mezzanine and was designed with very tight security measures so that it would stave off any type of robbery attempt. Legend has it that several of the Depression-era bank robbers, such as Pretty Boy Floyd and Bonnie and Clyde, came to stake out a possible heist. However, once they noticed the security guards, who in those days were armed with Tommy guns and posted in several of these balconies along both sides of the lobby, as well as the distance between the closest teller box and their escape route down these stairs, they quickly exited and went on to the next town. Much like those bank robbers, Marcia Schubert, Bill Hickman, Bernie Madoff, and Charles Ponzi were financial predators. And while they either have or will serve time behind bars, there are many others out there who will stop at nothing to get their hands on your money. And just like the folks who used to deposit their funds into this bank, you too should have peace of mind with your financial future. We've all heard about Bernie Madoff and his billion dollar securities fraud, the biggest Ponzi fraud committed in the United States. Ponzi frauds occur throughout this country more frequently than you can imagine. In fact, many have occurred right here in our own backyard. But for size and scope, the case we're going to tell you about is similar to the Madoff case. This case is, therefore, a mini Madoff. Also, it is the subject of the second documentary produced by InvestEd, the voice of investor protection in Oklahoma, from a closed case file of the Oklahoma Securities Commission. By seeing how this real fraud was perpetrated on real people like me and you, we hope that you can learn how to avoid becoming a victim. There is a lot to learn, but look for at least these three points. What are the facts that turn these ordinary securities transactions into fraud? What are some of the red flags that should tip you off that you're about to be swindled? What happened to the people who received more from the scam than they put in even though they were not involved in the con. The people living in the communities around Crescent, Oklahoma found themselves trusting in a person who had spent her whole life in that area. The people who knew her never believed that she could have swindled more than $9 million from people who invested with her. Northwestern Oklahoma is made up of small agricultural and ranching communities that are built on hard work, faith, family, and trust in their fellow man. It's a part of the world where the line separating small towns is a two-lane country road. Crescent, Oklahoma, located near the center of Logan County and northwest of Oklahoma City, is one of these communities. It's a community where there are no strangers and nobody thinks twice about helping a neighbor in need. It's a community of people whose relationships are based on trust. Many folks here in Crescent get their news sitting on their front porch enjoying their morning coffee. In the fall of 2004, the headlines created a panic that swept through Logan County like an Oklahoma wildfire. One of Crescent's most trusted was accused of operating an investment scheme that resulted in a loss of nearly $10 million to Oklahoma investors. The reason the news was so stunning was the identity of the perpetrator. Marcia K. Schubert grew up in a farming and ranching family just a few miles west of Crescent in Dover, Oklahoma. She was the high school homecoming queen. Shortly thereafter, she married Richard Schubert and they settled down in Crescent. While they were raising their three children, Richard ran a farming and cattle operation. Marcia became well known around Logan County while working in the banking, insurance, and securities industry. In 1992, Marcia became a registered broker with AXA Advisors, a national brokerage firm working from her office in Crescent. Well, Marcia Schubert became a registered broker in 1992. She was affiliated with a national brokerage firm and was successful in managing her clients' accounts. However, in addition to the legitimate business through her registered broker, 
Marsha Schubert began offering investments in her own unregistered company. Marsha told her clients that she would use their money to buy and sell securities and make them a profit. But Marsha never made any investments. Instead, she used most of the money to pay other investors, falsely claiming they were earning profits. More than $200 million flowed in and out of Marsha Schubert's bank account at Farmers and Merchants Bank here in Crescent. Marsha Schubert had even convinced some of her investors they were receiving returns in excess of 30%. Richard Reynolds had provided for his family and saved money for the future. He built his own business producing agricultural equipment. Around 2003, Reynolds sold the business he had worked so hard to build. At this time, he and his wife were planning on settling down in their retirement years. However, Reynolds' retirement fund could have done better. He too had heard of some of the great investment returns Schubert was getting with people's money over in Crescent. Uh, a friend of mine was at a little gift shop here in Kingfisher and he was in there visiting with his sister-in-law and uh, another mutual friend walked in, his name was Marvin Wilcox, and uh, he asked Marvin what he's doing. He says, well, I'm buying my stockbroker a Christmas present. And this friend of mine says, well, I'm not buying mine one. We're not making any money. And so Marvin commences to tell him how much money she's making for him and how good it is. Our, our stockbroker had gone elsewhere so we were kind of left, and uh, so we started moving our IRAs and a little bit of trust money and um, just some savings that we had had over the years. I had bought a little real estate off and on for years, and it became, uh, got some value to it. So as we sold this real estate, we'd just take the money over to Marsha, and uh, my wife and I would sit down with her and ask her, you know, how, how do you want this check made out? She said, oh, just make it out to, Mar to uh, Schubert and Associates. Richard Reynolds and his wife maintained a conservative lifestyle. Like many people, they were simply looking for a place to have their retirement funds safely grow. Steve Sanders was looking for the same safety while hoping to earn extra income each month to take care of health care needs. Steve Sanders had spent his entire life running the plumbing business his grandfather had started over 80 years earlier in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Not long ago, his wife was diagnosed with a serious illness, and Steve himself encountered health problems that sent his monthly health insurance premium skyrocketing. The Sanders' retirement income was not enough to meet their monthly financial needs. Sanders decided to seek Marsha Schubert's help to turn his savings into more monthly income. My health insurance costs had gone so high that I wasn't able to pay the $1,700 a month for my wife and myself, so I asked my father-in-law to ask Marvin if Marsha was taking any new customers. We sat down and I told her my needs and what I, you know, my wife and I just, I, I, I couldn't make enough income to pay my bills. And she said, Steve, we can, we, can, we can do this. We can make you that much money. Steve Sanders and Richard Reynolds were not the only people who were hearing the news either. Many folks around this part of the state were investing with Marsha Schubert and some talked of receiving extraordinary returns. Some even believe that their Schubert and Associates investments were doing so well, they created a construction boom with many people building new homes. What Steve Sanders, Richard Reynolds, and the rest of the participants in Marsha Schubert's investment program did not realize is that there were no investments. All of the returns that people were enjoying were simply fictitious because Marsha Schubert was running a classic Ponzi scheme. When the initial investors gave Marsha money to invest, she quickly turned around and wrote them checks that she claimed was their return of their principal plus a substantial profit. And this, of course, convinced them that she was a successful, experienced options trader and they were excited and wanted to invest more money and um, they told all their friends and their family about it and those people wanted to invest too. And Marsha, um, she then made verbal representations to these people of what the value of their accounts were and most of the people were happy not to withdraw the money but to keep reinvesting and, and trust that what she was saying was the amount uh, that was there. However, Marcia never uh, invested the money that she said she was going to invest in the options market. Instead, she used that money to pay other investors, a classic Ponzi scheme. Marsha Schubert told her investors that she was an experienced options trader and that she could make them great returns through options trading. Options trading involves making predictions about whether the value of a security is going to rise or fall uh, during a specific time period. And Marsha described to her clients how she stayed up really late at night and got up really early in the morning to, uh, to 
analyze the foreign options markets. Well, she sat down and tried to explain that to me, and I really never have done options and never done them before, but she had sat down with a piece of paper and she came around and sat on my side of the desk and she said, well, here's where we do this, here's where we do this. But I could see where she had bought and sold in an options account. It was probably under her name, I'm guessing. And I said, hey, fine, if we can do money this way, we'll do it. And you know, I wasn't trying to be greedy, I just wanted to pay my health insurance. The reason it's so important to understand what happens with your money is that not all perpetrators start out that way. Charles Ponzi wanted to buy some fruit at the market on his way home from work. With only the money from a recent investor in his pocket, he chose to use that to make his purchase with the idea that he would simply use his own funds to deposit for the investor. Once he realized how easy that was to simply use an investor's money for his own gain, the die was cast. Throughout this whole scheme, most of her clients believe Marcia was investing their funds through the national firm where she was employed. In the spring of 2004, Schubert contacted her clients to inform them she was changing brokerage firms. I remember it took, I thought, uh, an extra long time to get everything moved over. It was, she would call us and had to have something else signed. And then in a few days she'd say, well, they didn't like this, so we had to have something else signed. So my wife and I would go over there and we'd sign something else. She just basically said, we were, we were doing the AXA account, and, and she said we were going to transfer and do a, a different brokerage firm. And I said, well, why are we changing? And she said, well, in her words, AXA pissed me off. In fact, she had been allowed to resign as a result of a regulatory violation. As always, Marcia put on a good face and no one asked any questions. Over the four-year period that Marcia ran her Ponzi scheme, there were over 250 investors in, in the scheme, and she, uh, these investors included retirees, doctors, families, uh, family members of Marcia, and, and friends, longtime friends that she had. It was about this time Richard Reynolds had his first concern about Marcia Schubert. It had now been approximately four months since Marcia's move away from AXA, and Richard Reynolds still had not received a monthly statement from Schubert and Associates. Reynolds' accountant informed him that something was wrong. We talked to our accountant and, and uh, he had asked us, amongst other things, about what are you doing about investments. And uh, my comment, I said, well, we're investing with a lady over in Crescent, but we're not getting any statements. Well, he just, he threw his pencil down on his desk and threw his hands up and he said, Richard, you got to get statements. And so the next trip over to Marcia's, I'd tell her, I said, Marcia, I've got to have statements. We must have something in writing here from these companies. Oh, she'd say, they're, they're just right behind me here on the disc, and, and uh, I just hadn't printed them out yet. I'll print them out the end of the month. Marcia Schubert always had excuses and oftentimes played guessing games with her clients on how much their investment accounts were worth. Well, we always played this little guessing game. I'd go in there with a legal pad, and I'd have my accounts down there, and I'd ask her, you know, what are they worth? And she'd say, well, what do you think they're worth? And, of course, she'd always tell you this worth more than what you thought they were worth. Well, this one particular time, my wife was not with me. And in a short period of time, I'm thinking six weeks or two months, uh, uh, this one, one account, and it had made, according to her, over $100,000. And of course, when anybody tells you that, well, you're elated. So I, I go back out, get my pickup, start to drive home, and I call my wife. And I said, Ninda, you're not going to believe what this account's done. And I told her. And my wife, being very conservative, she said, Richard, I don't believe that. So I, I just drove back up there. I walked back in and talked to Marcia. And I said, Marcia, you know, I was talking to my wife about this, and I said, she doesn't believe this. And Marcia's comment was, and she looked me right in the eye, and she says, well, call her and ask her if she wants me to write her a check. Well, that was pretty convincing to me if, if she was willing to write a check for it right that minute. Back in Crescent, Marcia Schubert also distributed checks to her clients in the form of fictitious returns. In that last month, and I don't remember the amounts of the checks, but she basically had two checks made out to me, and, and I said, well, Marcia, really, I don't, I don't need this money right now. Before I left that day, she said, Steve, you, here, you're, I'm gonna write you a check for $10,000, and it'll make your wife feel better. And she called me up, just out of the clear blue. I had not asked for any income. This was our retirement money. I was trying to preserve it. 
and she said, I've got a check for you. I said, what do you got a check for me for? She said, well, some things came up and I didn't have anything good to put it back in, so I just cashed it in. A few days, I go over and get the check, and she gave me a check for $48,000, I believe. As I'm sitting there, she hands me another check. It was $65,000. I said, what is that for? And she, same story. And um, so I said, well, what am I going to do with it? She said, well, you have to take it home and cash it and then do whatever you want to do. She said, if you want to bring it back, that's fine. So I did. I brought, I brought it home. I think that amounted to about $114,000, the total of those two checks. And my wife and I talked about it. We kept about nineteen dollars or $20,000, and I took her back a check on September 23rd of $95,000. Just days later, the Oklahoma Securities Commission received an anonymous inquiry about Schubert and Associates. As a result, a team of examiners was sent to Crescent to find out what was taking place at the Crescent office of Marcia Schubert. The department received an anonymous tip regarding the investment activities of Marcia Schubert and Schubert and Associates. And on October 5, 2004, Securities Commission investigators went to Marcia Schubert's office. None of the records required to be maintained by a brokerage firm indicated any problems or suspicious activities. However, the carbon copies of the telephone message log told another story. Marcia Schubert was receiving numerous calls from individuals inquiring about their account balances. A significant number of callers were requesting disbursements from their accounts. We began cross-checking the phone messages with the caller's brokerage account statements and found there to be many discrepancies. No options trading had occurred, and others who were requesting disbursements did not have the money available in their brokerage accounts to cover their requested disbursement amounts. It was only a matter of days between the time the Oklahoma Securities Commission received its initial tip and when the agency obtained a court order to close down Schubert & Associates. This particular investigation was very paper intensive and very labor intensive. There were numerous bank accounts that had to be analyzed. There were thousands of transactions. The department filed a civil action in Logan County District Court. The judge ordered an asset freeze and appointed Doug Jackson as the receiver over the operations of Schubert & Associates. Soon after his appointment, Doug Jackson held a town hall meeting at the Crescent Community Center. It was filled to capacity with investors and other interested parties. But very simply, my job is to find the assets and then within what the law allows me to do, convert those assets to cash is that if you know of any assets, whether it be cash, cattle, land, cars, condos, whatever it may be, that Schubert and, Association, Schubert and Associates may have purchased with your money, then you need to let me know so that I can find those assets and under the supervision of the court, proceed against those assets. I can tell you from previous experience, it's hard to unscramble the omelet. Once it's been scrambled and everything's been co-mingled, it's terribly difficult to figure out what the scheme was, to figure out whose money went where. And if the records that, that, that Mrs. Schubert has, if they have been destroyed or they don't exist, then we're just going to be up on our own as far as looking at the checks and figuring money in, money out. Not long after that, Marcia Schubert was facing both state and federal charges, stemming from money laundering and acquiring money through false pretenses through the operation of a Ponzi scheme. She cooperated with both federal and state authorities. She was very helpful. She met with uh, investigators and attorneys from the Oklahoma Securities Commission, as well as federal investigators from the FBI, IRS, uh, and uh, helped us decipher the, the bank records, uh, helped us uh, trace where the money went and it was somewhat uh, difficult because there were a number of bank accounts involved and uh, she was very helpful with us once she uh, accepted responsibility for what she did. Doug Jackson explains that after five years of investigations and lawsuits brought on by victims and the Oklahoma Securities Commission, this story actually has a very positive ending for many of the people who lost money in the Marsha Schubert investment scam. When the case began, I told the investors, and there were several investor meetings, and again, I'm talking about the folks that are short, that probably 10% on the low side to maybe 25% is what we would recover. Uh, as the case has progressed, uh, we've, we've had a few breaks, and what we've been able to do is the, the sources of recovery were the assets that Mr. Schubert had, uh, the long investors, 
And then some of the investors went ahead and brought actions against the brokers that were involved and there have been arbitration proceedings. And as they recovered money, and this is some of the, the short investors that brought their own actions, then their claims were reduced. Uh, the claim started out at about nine and a half million dollars and then we had a couple distributions that knocked it down to the five or six million range. Then there were additional uh, recoveries made by individuals and, and we did allow them to deduct their attorney's fees. So we've got it down now to where if I were to disperse the money that I have on hand that the claims are going to be less than a million dollars. Uh, it appears that if we get another break or two that the people are going to be made not whole but, but, but close to whole and it, it could well be above 90% of their original investment. Now, they didn't get interest during that period of time, but it's been so much better than we had uh, anticipated that uh, we're pleasantly surprised. We hope that you have learned from this show some ways to protect yourself from securities fraud. Remember the three points I mentioned at the beginning? The people who received returns greater than they put into the Ponzi even though innocent of any wrongdoing, had to pay such returns back. What starts out as a normal financial transaction can quickly become a securities fraud if you, the investor, are not on your toes. Watch out for an agent that is unexpectedly terminated at his or her brokerage firm for unclear, poorly explained reasons. Watch out selling away from the firm by selling investments through a company other than the brokerage. Watch out for an agent who starts selling exotic or uncommon investments that he or she has little experience selling and that are difficult for you to understand. Did you spot the red flagged issues we wanted to particularly drive home? If you take nothing else away from the program, we hope you remember at least these points. Never write a check to the individual broker or some entity other than the registered brokerage firm. Writing checks to Schubert & Associates instead of AXA should have raised questions that could have prevented the losses. So as we sold this real estate, we'd just take the money over to Marcia and uh, my wife and I would sit down with her and ask her, you know, how, how do you want this check made out? She said, oh, just make it out to, Mar to uh, Schubert & Associates. It is not unusual for an individual broker to change firms, but you should find out what the real reasons for the change are by contacting the brokerage firm directly. Do not accept at face value your broker's stated reasons for leaving. She just basically said, we were, we were doing the AXA account and, and she said we were gonna transfer and do a, a different brokerage firm. And I said, well, why are we changing? And she said, well, in her words, AXA pissed me off. Depending on the frequency of transactions in your account, you should always receive periodic statements from the brokerage firm, but never less frequently than quarterly. You must also receive written confirmations on all account transactions. We talked to our accountant and, and uh, he had asked us, amongst other things, about what are you doing about investments? And uh, my comment, I says, well, we're investing with a lady over in Crescent, but we're not getting any statements. Well, he just, he threw his pencil down on his desk and threw his hands up and he said, Richard, you gotta get statements. Be suspicious of receiving investment profit distributions from your account written on checks other than those of the brokerage firm. Checks from the individual broker or some entity other than the brokerage firm are signs that something is wrong. And she called me up, just out of the clear blue. I had not asked for any income. This was our retirement money. I was trying to preserve it. And she said, I've got a check for you. I said, what do you got a check for me for? She says, well, some things came up and I didn't have anything good to put it back in. So I just cashed it in. If you think you or someone you know has become a victim of investment fraud, or for more information on the topics covered in this presentation, you can contact the Oklahoma Securities Commission at 405 280 7700 or through their website at securities.ok.gov. And for more investor education information, you can visit the InvestEd website at investedok.org. 
The InvestEd site offers a wealth of investor education resources, including the complete InvestEd TV and Radio Investment Minute Library, the InvestEd Investor Protection Kit, and information about InvestEd STARS, students tracking and researching the stock market. STARS is a stock market portfolio program designed for grades 9 through 12. 